of this program. All right. If you do have any questions, please put them in the chat and um, we will um, address those as Nancy can. So again, thank you, Nancy, and I'm so excited. So I'm going to pass the screen over to you. Well, thank you very much, Cindy. And um, let me first begin by apologizing to all of you who may have been in on the previous uh, date that this lecture was planned for. Um, I am uh, horrified to say that um, I am recently retired and I was still still figuring out how to keep track of my new life. Uh, and so I have no excuse other than um, deep, deep apologies. Uh, but I'm delighted to see that so many of you are here today and I'm delighted to share this story with you. Um, and uh, and as the um, bio was going through, I was thinking, yeah, right, that is my old life. Um, and one of the high points of my old life at Historic New England, where I worked for 35 years before retiring on December 30th, um, was this project. And it began around 2005 and resulted in a book and exhibition that opened in 2008. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about how it came to be. Um, but in the meantime, um, I want to begin by asking each of you to just think for a moment about kitchens in your life. Um, what comes to mind when you think of kitchens, think of kitchens you've spent time in. Um, and um, the reason I ask you to do that is that it is, I think, without question, the most braided room in the house. It's the, it's the room in the house that carries the most weight um, in terms of family memory, in terms of personal accomplishment or not. Um, and, and I'm going to guess that when some of you have thought about kitchens in your life, you've thought about time spent with family. Um, this is a former colleague of mine with her daughter and granddaughter. Um, and we had hoped to put this image on the back because of the back of the book, because I think it's completely charming, but it got nixed for showing unhygienic processes or unhygienic practices. Um, and so please don't uh, wash your babies in the kitchen sink should you um, have that opportunity. Um, so you may have thought about time spent with uh, multiple generations in your family. You might have thought about time spent with friends in the kitchen. The kitchen has become very much a social space in the last few decades. This is a group of women from Georgetown who met over years uh, monthly to play a game called Pochino, I think. Um, but in any case, it became, of course, much more of a social gathering centered around the kitchen. And I'm also guessing that many of you will have thought of time spent with elders. Um, and, and the interesting thing about this project as we started, uh, my colleague Melinda and I, was that when we talked to people about kitchens, you could almost see their taste buds moistening. I mean, there, the, it brought on this deep well of nostalgia. Um, and, and it's a curious phenomenon that I have never been able to crack down because not all things that happen in the kitchen are wonderful. Um, and yet people's memories tend to be wonderful. And I have one friend who theorized that perhaps it's because, and now this I'm just telling you right now, has no basis in reality. It may, it may absolutely not be true, but he theorized that the um, sensation of smell is uh, related to the amygdala in the brain, which is also this, the place that holds memories. So his feeling was that it was related very um, specifically to uh, brain anatomy. Be that as it may, the curious thing for me is that the kitchen is not only a time of wonderment, but it can be a time of um, anxiety. For instance, trying to work out uh, cooking a recipe out of Cook's Illustrated in time for the Christmas holidays. Um, I will say as uh, not a um, 
uh, cook myself. It's always a place of anxiety when I'm performing in it. It is no matter who you are and how good you are, it is always a workspace. More than any other room in the house, the kitchen is a workspace. So again, why this nostalgia built around it? And then finally, although this is a fairly benign image, because it's the place where family tends to gather, it can also be the place of, um, of conflict. Um, and in fact, there are uh, many stories of extreme conflict that take place in the kitchen. And yet, that's not what comes to mind, usually when you talk to people about their kitchens. So it was, um, it was an underlying question that Melinda and I thought about as we talk to people about kitchens and as we started in on this project, and it remains an unresolved one. That said, um, I'm here to tell you about how the kitchen has changed over time, in, certainly in the Northeast, but in other parts of America as well. And the reason this was an important topic for me to tackle is that in my role as curator at Historic New England, I was responsible for um, the interiors of 38 historic buildings, um, which are based in five New England states from Connecticut to Maine and New Hampshire. Um, and those buildings range in date from, for instance, this um, 17th century stone ender in Rhode Island, to a wonderful riverside 18th century property in South Berwick, Maine, to the 1938 Walter Gropius House in Lincoln, uh, Massachusetts. Um, and in those 38 historic houses, we have, believe it or not, more than 80 kitchens, in part because some houses grew over time. And as um, you expanded from big house, little house, back house, barn, you might move the kitchen along. Um, and some properties had multiple housing on them. Uh, they might have a, a small cabin on the property as well. So we had more than 80 kitchens to um, oversee and talk about and interpret. And uh, as someone who, as I've already admitted, is not much of a cook, um, kitchens were a little bit of a mystery to me. Um, and so it was a really important topic just for better understanding our own buildings. In our historic houses, we have amazingly intact historic kitchens. This one is at the Runlet May House in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It dates to the time the house was built in 1804. And at the time, it was the Cadillac of kitchens. It was a extremely modern, highly technologically advanced kitchen. Um, and, uh, and its owner was a entrepreneur who was interested in technology, which is reflected in that kitchen. We have this wonderful farmhouse kitchen at the Spencer Pierce Little Farm, which was lived in by um, an elderly pair uh, triplet of sisters. They weren't triplets, but three sisters, as well as a Lithuanian family who worked the farm. But the reason to study the kitchen um, as a historian is that um, for much of American history, it was a virtual certainty that it was the women in the family or for the privileged class, female servants, who were responsible for feeding members of the household. So the history of the kitchen is in many ways the history of women. It's a history that survives not so much in words, but in spaces, in artifacts, in routines, and in recipes. So for many, knowing what went on in the kitchen is the closest we'll come to knowing our grandmothers' grandmothers. So um, just to a little background about the how this all happened. Um, the way that we went about our, res our research for this uh, project was, of course, we looked at documents and books as one does as historians. But we also very much wanted to tell the story in pictures. And so we did a lot of picture research and we were breaking out of our New England boundaries. Um, and so we were looking at um, pictures of kitchens from across the country. 
So for instance, at the Library of Congress, we learned about an indigenous family in New Mexico and their kitchen. We learned about the beginning of the frozen food industry, um, or at least frozen food for the domestic industry um, through some of the photographs at the Library of Congress. And this was 2006 or so. And um, newly available were increasing numbers of images online. And one of our best sources at the time, 2006, was the Wisconsin Historical Society. And at that time, they had 170 images online uh, of various kitchens in Wisconsin, which sounds terrific, right? But I wanted to see, I looked today, well, how many do they have on now? I assume thousands. And um, unfortunately, they've changed their search mechanism, and all I could find were two. So um, sometimes one step forward and two steps back. We also wanted to, of course, learn about how kitchens functioned. And one of the ways that we did that was by going to historic museums that have living history. Um, and so this is uh, one of the women who cooked regularly at Colonial Williamsburg, um, and we interviewed her in person. Um, and I was able to speak to this woman who had been cooking at this kitchen hearth for more than 20 years at Old Sturbridge Village. And so I was able to ask her, all right, why is this here and that there? And what do you keep close by? And what are your most important tools and et cetera? And really get a sense from her about the lived experience of working in this kind of kitchen. But then we also decided that we needed to experience it ourselves. And at the time there was a woman who we discovered in Long Island named Alice Ross, who was older than me, but one of the first ever PhDs in food history. Um, and she had created what she called an experiment station in her carriage house on Long Island, where she had a hearth on one side of the room and a cook stove on the other. So we went for three days and day one learned about hearth cooking. And um, the first surprise for me was that hearth cooking is not about the flame. It's about the embers. So you create a fire with flame in order to get all these lovely embers, which you then move around on the hearth, for instance, underneath this pot that's cooking soup, um, or over and around this Dutch oven, which enables you essentially to bake things like bread or cake without having to start your whole bake oven. So it was eye-opening. Um, and then day two, was spent on the cook stove on the other side of the carriage house. Um, and you can see right away, there's a great advantage and that is that you're upright. So you're not uh, doing the back breaking work of working on your knees, but there's a disadvantage as well. And the disadvantage is that you've lost sight of the flame, you've lost sight of the fire. And so it takes um, a different skill set to learn how to maintain your fire and how to regulate the heat in a way that is perhaps a little easier uh, at a hearth. And day three was cooking in a bake oven. And this was also um, a whole new experience for me. Some of you may know this already, but the way you cook in a bake oven is that you fill, uh, you fill the oven with fire. Um, you put wood in, you light a fire, and you let it heat up the bricks. And uh, you wait three or four hours until your bricks inside, you can look inside, are white hot. And at that point, you pull out the embers and you slam a door on and you let the temperature regular or regulate or, um, or come to uh, stasis. And um, then you test it by either putting a piece of linen perhaps on the end of a peel and sticking it in and seeing how long it takes for it to burn, or you test it by sticking your hand in and testing it that way. And as you can imagine, if you're an experienced person who bakes at a bake oven like this, you can tell pretty quickly what the temperature is like. 
So the first thing that happens once you've pulled out the embers and they fall down to the brick floor below, and then you clean out the base of the um, oven with a wet rag um, at the end of a long pole, and then you wait for it to regulate, um, and then you put things in according to temperature. So the first things that go in are the things that require the hottest temperature, like bread. Um, next, you might go down to the things that require the next hot temperature, like cakes, after that pies, and then finally, um, when the temperature has cooled significantly, you put in beans that'll stay in overnight and cook at a low, a long, slow temperature. And the reason I'm going into this detail is to um, help you understand that cooking um, using this technology was um, a learned skill. <clears throat> it wasn't magical. There were um, centuries that had gone into creating the technology that these women were working with, um, and they knew how to cook uh, using this technology. It was, it was simply a way of applying heat to food. So in addition to wanting to learn how to cook using uh, historic techniques, we also wanted to get a sense of surviving historic kitchens around the country. And so we wrote to every state historic preservation officer asking him or her to tell us about what kitchens they knew of that had survived. Um, and surprisingly or not, um, most surviving kitchens are in the Northeast. Um, this one is in Chicago. This is at the Glessner House, which was built in the 1880s in Chicago. Um, but we found very few um, as you get further west and south. Um, this was a kitchen in New Mexico. It's not particularly old, but I like it because it has that kind of revival style. It was built in the 1950s by an uh, antiquarian who studied the history of New Mexican architecture. One of my favorite kitchens is this very unprepossessing one, which is in Kittery, Maine. And it was the kitchen that belonged to a black couple who had worked as servants to Philadelphia families. And they and other servants who worked for Philadelphia families would drive up from Philadelphia to Bar Harbor every summer to spend the summer up there cooking, um, cleaning, et cetera. And the problem was that there were very few places that they could stop and stay overnight and get good food along the way. Um, there was a green book um, which told uh, members of, of um, working class Blacks where they might be able to stay and find food. And this was one of them. The fam these couple who had been servants themselves decided that they would create a welcoming home for others who were traveling north. And um, there are people who survive in the Portsmouth area who remember traveling through and staying at this house. And what they remember are amazing meals cooked in this very tiny kitchen. Um, and I think that is a um, important thing for us to bear in mind is that it doesn't take a um, high-end kitchen to create amazing meals. So we organized the book um, around seven real historic kitchens um, based all over the country and uh, ranging in date from the 18th century to the 20th. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is, and we used each of those specific houses to be a launching point to then talk about kitchens in the 18th century in the Northeast or uh, kitchens in New Mexico in the 18th century as well. Um, I'm going to focus on five of these kitchens because there's not time to talk about all of them. And we'll start with the kitchen that is at this house. This is one of historic New England's houses. It's the Coffin House in Newbury, Massachusetts. What you're seeing is an 18, 1713 edition, which is attached to a 17th century house from about 1680. And here you can see where the, I can get my pointer there, where the 17th century house attaches to the 18th, larger 18th century edition. And the kitchen that you see here is right below this chimney, 
with these two windows. Um, it backs onto an earlier kitchen, which um, has this chimney, but the um, chimneys meet. And so this, um, if you uh, broke through, would go into the 17th century kitchen. So the, the hearth itself dates to about 1713. The chimney has been rebuilt probably once since that time. And then in 1770, uh, time of the revolution, they added this paneling and this dresser. So it is largely intact from the 1770s. And in the 1770s, there were three generations of Coffin family members <clears throat> living in the house. And you get a sense of how it was used from this isometric drawing, which we'll see more of as we go forward. Um, and what this uh, image implies is that this child's mother, who is at the hearth, worked closely with her mother-in-law in the newer kitchen. But in fact, that is unlikely. It seems pretty clear that women liked sovereignty all over their own hearth. So I think it's more likely that the grandmother worked at her own kitchen, which backs onto this one, which would have been the kitchen she was used to working with, while her daughter-in-law worked at this one. And the reason I say that is that there's a wonderful book called um, Reminiscences of a Nonagenarian. Um, I think the author was last name was Emery, but in any case, it's about um, a woman's memories written in the 1850s of growing up in Newbury and Newburyport in the uh, third quarter and fourth quarter of the 18th century. And among the things that she discusses is a pair of sisters-in-law um, where the newly married sister-in-law moved into a house where her sister-in-law was already living. And for about six months, they shared the same hearth. And the author writes that, in fact, they each of them um, worked separately. So each of them worked on their own corner of their hearth. And as she writes, never a harsh word was spoken. Um, and so I think what that indicates is that um, the choice was to have the um, power over your own hearth um, to, to feed your family. There's a misconception um, that has been perpetrated by 20th century um, historical society workers uh, about the amount of kitchen equipment that was in kitchens in the 18th century and 17th century. And that's because um, there has been a tendency to put every single piece of kitchen equipment that a collection has into the hearth so that you can see it. But in fact, if you look at this um, broadside from the 17th century, you can see that in fact, people lived with very few things. This is what they were uh, encouraged to bring with them if they were emigrating to the colonies, um, very few um, objects. And this is for a family of six. And once they arrived, there would be no money to buy new or to make new. In fact, all your investment would go into making your farm work, making your new business work, it would go into survival. And so for uh, a good generation or two or three, women lived with very few items. Among the people that we talked to as we were doing this project was the food historian at what was then Plymouth Plantation and now Plymouth Pentuxet. Um, and they were able to talk about um, the people who did living history there. And, and um, the docents were, or the guides were assigned to particular houses. And it was known exactly what equipment was in each of those houses. And apparently there was a lot of competition to get into the house that had a frying pan because it made their lives much easier, but not everybody at Plymouth had one. There's uh, been a, maybe I'll call it an old wives tale that um, women died in the kitchen um, from that the that the highest leading cause of death was uh, from fire. And the fact of the matter is that that's not true. And the reason that or or the evidence, among others, that I can tell you that's not true, is that this um, notice 
of Mrs. Moses of King Street of Charleston, South Carolina, dying in a fire, um, was published in a Portsmouth, New Hampshire newspaper in the 18th century. And I don't think it's because she was related. I think it's because it was rare. And the reason that it was rare is that in the 17th and 18th, the early 19th century, women's clothing was wool or linen. And wool and linen do not burn. They simply smolder. What burns is cotton. So it's not until the 19th century that you start having the danger of death from fire. Um, but pretty soon, at least in the northern part of the country, people start living with cook stoves. And so there's less danger of um, embers getting onto cotton clothing. Um, and so it is a misconception that women died from fire commonly. Um, but less um, true is, or, or more true, is the problem with children. Because, of course, children are um, not always careful. And the kitchen was a place where families gathered. And so, as you can see from this um, drawing, there was a danger of scalding as opposed to burning from uh, working around a kitchen. The kitchen in the 18th, 17th, and 18th century was command central, especially during butchering. And here we see butchering being processed um, in a Pennsylvania kitchen. Um, and the reason for that is that butchering takes place during a, a cold snap. And it has to, the meat has to be processed quickly before it spoils. And so in a community, uh, people would take turns butchering, and then they would go from house to house and help process. And it was an all uh, hands on deck process. Men and women, boys and girls were all involved in processing meat so that it could be smoked, it could be um, changed into sausage, it could be preserved in various ways to get you through the season. Um, but um, you would go from house to house because it was such a labor intensive process. Now, it is also true, however, that the kitchen was the one room in the house <clears throat> that could be counted on to be warm. So in the winter, <clears throat> it was a workspace for men and boys, uh, women and girls. And so it was a gathering space for all members of the family. Now we're going to leap forward hundred years to this house, <clears throat> which is the David Davis Mansion in Bloomington, Illinois. And here you see David Davis in all his glory. Um, he was a close friend of Abraham Lincoln. They rode the legal circuit together. And when Lincoln was uh, elected president, he brought David Davis in as a member of the Supreme Court, where he served for 15 years. During those 15 years, he and his wife <clears throat> built the house that you see here, which was built in 1870. Um, the good news for us is that he was away when the house was being built. He was in Washington, and therefore it was his wife, Sarah Davis, who oversaw the building of the house. And she wrote frequently to him, the letters survive, which describe the process and describe her um, questions that she would send in to him or her concerns or some of the things that she was working on. And one of the things that she writes about in those letters is that she's trying to decide what type of stove to put in the kitchen. And she knows that a neighbor of hers has just put a very modern, large, built-in cook stove like the one you see here in the neighbor's house. But the problem is that she and the neighbor don't speak. And so she's writing to her husband and describing how she's going to try and sneak her way in to her neighbor's kitchen to see this cook stove, which, in fact, she then does end up purchasing. Um, you can see from this image that the kitchen is a whole new ball of wax. Um, it is a um, it's a sort of engine for cooking, and it has various appurtenances that um, will work around the things that are needed for creating meals for a family. So for instance, here you have a china cabinet 
um, separated from the kitchen so you could pass things through with this little pass through here and imagine that there is a full wall. Um, and similarly, imagine a full wall here where you see a flower pantry, flour and sugar would be stored here and a pantry for a cooking equipment, as well as through this door, there would be an ice um, box as well. The kitchen was very much state of the art at the time. And you can see it's quite similar to the one that we see in this image, which was published in 1770 by Louis Prang, 1774, 1874, sorry. Um, and it is considered this uh, image is the ideal kitchen in America in 1874. And it has um, the things that you would expect, for instance, you know, a cook stove, whether it's a built in one like this one or the Davises, or whether it's freestanding coming out from the chimney wall. Um, it has windows uh, next to which um, are tables so that you have light to work with. Um, but the very exciting, very new, very um, uh, exotic thing that has um, been added to the kitchen is right here. And this is a brass water heater. And the kitchen is, or the cook stove is on, this built-in cook stove is on year round, 24 hours a day. And therefore you have hot water, which runs through a faucet into your sink 24 hours a day. And as I said, this is this is elegance beyond belief. Um, and it's a long time before this kind of um, technology becomes mainstream. But the other piece of new technology in the kitchen is the clock. Because before this time, clocks were very expensive and they were in parlors or in entrance halls. Um, but few people, in fact, virtually no one would have a clock in their kitchen. Um, at least no one in America. And to have a clock in your kitchen changes things. And if like me, you have learned to cook um, from cookbooks, you know that you cook to time. And unfortunately, I think something's lost by cooking to time because you lo lose sight of cooking to doneness. And uh, before there were clocks, um, and very good cooks, of course, now do cook to doneness. As a not good cook, I'm here to tell you that I cooked a time and it is not always a successful way to cook. So it's now a gathering space, but more often than not, it's a gathering space for women. It's a gathering space for family members, women, female family members, um, and sometimes for a boy who may not be feeling well or who's being punished. Um, and in this case, he's peeling potatoes. Um, but it is a well-lit space, as I said earlier, from windows. Um, and it's a workspace, but it's a female workspace as opposed to the kitchens that we saw earlier. And here you can see that the kitchen has been removed from Command Central. It's no longer at the heart of the home. It's off in an extension wing. So these three windows are the windows of the kitchen. This is the china pantry separating the kitchen from the main part of the house. And this is the dining room. So it's close by, but you don't get the noise and you don't get the smells and heaven forbid, you don't have to deal with the people working in the kitchen. Um, so there's a, a period in this um, time uh, of an increasing concern about uh, the appearance of gentility. And to be genteel, one does not work. And so um, one would want to be perceived as somebody who could afford to spend time sitting in the parlor, reading, playing the piano, gathering with your family, and not actually having to do any work. It's a facade, of course, because even well-to-do families were working. They had to um, oversee the work going on in the kitchen or in the fields, where, or they were bringing in money. Um, but in any case, the facade was this, um, this, this appearance of not going behind the baize door, of not going behind the curtain, of staying in the formal spaces in the house. 
curiously, um, as the technology advances, or maybe not curiously, there's a backlash against it. And you get this sort of deep feeling of nostalgia that um, centers on the now forgotten hearth. And um, even more curious is the fact that it's a stove company that's using this image to advertise its new stove at the same time that it celebrates what the stove has replaced. Um, in fact, that nostalgia had a tendency to be stronger among men than women. Um, Nathaniel Hawthorne, for instance, wrote that he saw no beauty in the cook stove and he lamented its introduction, worrying that with the demise of the kitchen hearth, um, he wrote, quote, there will be nothing to attract children to one center. Domestic life will seek its separate corners. So in other words, this is the beginning of the end of family life, at least according to Nathaniel Hawthorne in the 1850s. Um, Sarah Orne Jewett, uh, another wonderful New England author, had a different view. And she described a man who waited until his wife was away and after a drink or two with a friend, took the stove apart piece by piece and disposed of it. Jewett observed that women, quote, knew better than their husbands did the difference this useful invention had made in their everyday work. But as with all new technology, um, while you have some gains, you also have some increasing um, work that's required. And here you can see this really great image of a young girl who's gotten her little hands dirty and you can see her paw prints on the dirty chrome of a fairly simple stove. Um, in this period, this is the middle of the 19th century, there are tons and tons of household advice books that are being published. And they tell women um, all the ways that they need to keep their house. And there are page after page um, devoted to how to keep your stove clean. And of course, those beautiful stoves that we saw earlier um, that were built in, that were very elaborate, were the worst to keep clean because the um, dirt would get encrusted in the chrome and in the ghee gauze decorating the front. And so before long, you'd come to uh, want something much more simple like what you see here. And the other thing that would happen with cook stoves is that um, before long, the chimney would back up. And so, um, and that's what you're seeing here. And so it was an annual task uh, given over to the men of the house to clean out the cook, cook stove flue at least once a year. And Mark Twain writes about this process, which he describes as the most vexation, but most vexatious that man can possibly imagine. And I'm showing you this very tranquil scene of a woman cooking at a cook stove. Um, and as you can see, it looks very peaceful. But of course, uh, cooking wasn't peaceful for everyone and not everyone found it enjoyable. And one of my favorite characters who we came across in the course of our studies was a woman named Hetty Morrison of Indianapolis who wrote extensively about housework, um, which she did not enjoy. Um, in 1878, she wrote, quote, not of my own free will did I enter upon a career of broiling, roasting, and baking. She complained, I wish to say that I think two thirds of cookbook makers should be hanged without benefit of clergy. So cook stoves became fairly prevalent beginning in the 1840s in the Northeast. Um, and by the 1880s, um, unless you were very poor, it was likely that you had a cook stove. However, if you lived uh, out in the territories, cook stoves would be much rarer. And the reason for that, and in fact, this is the Dakota territories, and you can see the woman of the house beaming, and I'm sure it's because she's very proud that she is one of the very few people out West who has a cook stove. The reason they were so rare is that people traveling West uh, in wagon trains learned that the heavier their wagon, the more likely it was to founder. And so if they had the misfortune to have a stove with them, more often than not, they jettisoned it off the side of the wagon before they got anywhere near their final destination. 
And there are these amazing letters written by women who grew up in the Northeast um, with an up-to-date kitchen, but traveled west um, for uh, a new adventure to start a family life um, in a new world. Um, and they write these really sort of heartbreaking letters about how hard their life is. And they can't um, believe that they're living with a technology that essentially their grandmothers lived with, um, which is to say they're cooking on an open hearth rather than in a cook stove, which is far more efficient. Um, and as I said, at least you're more upright um, than you were cooking on a hearth. And they didn't uh, have the experience cooking on hearths more, most likely. The other place there were not cook stoves was in the South, um, particularly in uh, enslaved, where there were enslaved populations. And that is because you had uh, free workers of a sort. And therefore, it did not pay to uh, build a modern kitchen. And so um, kitchens remained as they were in the 18th and early 19th centuries in the South, right up to and through the Civil War. Um, and then, of course, after that, there was a lot of poverty in the South. And so there wasn't enough money to create a more modern kitchen. And so women who moved from the North to the South talk about, again, having to learn to cook in a way that their grandmothers had cooked. So that was the 1870s. Now we're gonna leap forward to the 1920s. This is another one of historic New England's houses. This is Castle Tucker in Wiscasset, Maine. The main block of the house was built in 1804, and then in the traditional big house, little house, back house barn, um, we have the extensions that were added over time. And the kitchen in this house was built probably in the 1820s, but then updated over time. And it's these two windows that are the kitchen. And in fact, this is one of the windows that you can see here. <clears throat> this is along the same lines as the <clears throat> kitchen that was seen in the um, Louis Prang drawing um, and also at the David Davis mansion. Instead of a built-in stove, um, this stove has been um, <clears throat> put into the old kitchen chimney from 1803 or 1804. And you can see, in fact, this is where the bake oven was from 1804. Um, you've got a clock, very modern um, addition. But what really sets this kitchen apart and makes it modern is the addition which was added in the 1920s of this. <clears throat> and this, as some of you may recognize, is known as a Hoosier cabinet. It's a generic name for a type of cabinet that was first developed in Indiana by the Hoosier Company, but very soon was marketed by many companies. And it's the linchpin that um, separates the 19th century kitchen from the 20th. Um, this is the very beginning of the kitchen as we understand it, a modern kitchen. What's new about it is that for the first time, it brings together multiple processes into a single space. So here we have the drawing showing the kitchen that we saw before we were looking in this direction. And now you're looking towards this Hoosier cabinet sink over here from 1804. And also from 1804 is a pantry behind this door, behind this door, another pantry, and also behind this door, the stairs to the cellar. So in the cellar, you would have stored foods that could um, <clears throat> survive winters in the cellar. In the pantry, you would store things like flour that needed to stay dry, but also kitchen equipment and similarly in here. So in order to create a meal, you would be drawing on things from three different spaces that were not even inside your kitchen. Basements were very much part of food processing in uh, kitchens up until the 20th century. Um, and so once you have this, you're starting to pull together the processes. This was purchased by this woman's uh, daughters and sons for their elderly mother who was still cooking in uh, the 1920s. She would have been in her 
80s at that point. This is a very long-lived family, the Tucker family. Um, and they were trying to make her life easier. So among the things that this did was it provided a clean and easily cleanable work surface. And as I said, everything's all together. So instead of going to these multiple spaces, she could pull together her baking things all right here and then simply walk over to the stove as opposed to having to go many steps. And you'll see that before long, we start counting steps to understand what kitchen work is like. The Hoosier cabinet was enormously successful. Um, it was, as I said, the Hoosier company is the first company to make them, but before long, multiple companies are making them. And they're advertising that already in 1920, there are 4 million Hoosier cabinets in American houses. Um, again, uh, it is the linchpin, as I said, that starts to head us towards the modern kitchen as we understand it today. The Hoosier cabinet comes out of, interestingly enough, the uh, study of Taylorism in industry, which is time and motion studies that looked at industrial processes and ways to make them more efficient. Um, and the reason for that is that a domestic um, worker named uh, Christine Frederick was married to a man who was a business executive and he was involved in high motion studies in industry. And she had an aha moment when she thought, I can do that and I can look at how to make cooking more efficient. And so she created what she called an uh, experiment station in her household on Long Island where she timed people. And so here you have a woman who is um, uh, beating eggs. And you've got a man with a stopwatch who is um, counting how long it takes her to do it a certain way and writing notes. You've got another observer behind her who's also writing notes. And Christine Frederick will go into detail about whether she's facing left, whether she's facing right, what she has on her left, what she has on her right, and how to make this the most efficient process possible. And she gets behind the development of the Hoosier cabinet and in fact, companies quote her uh, supporting their particular Hoosier cabinet. Um, and, and really she's a pivotal figure in the development of the modern kitchen, not only in America, but in Europe as well. She was brought into Europe to, um, to work with industrialists who were thinking about ways to create a new kitchen. And before long, as I said, a lot of people are counting steps and they're looking not only at um, moving outside of the kitchen and ways to bring everything into the same space, but also the layout of the kitchen. And before long, they develop the well-known U-shaped kitchen, which has the range and the refrigerator and the sink um, placed around uh, three sides of the kitchen without anything in the middle and, um, and tracing what that would mean in terms of footsteps. Whereas once you stick something in the middle of a room like this, you start to have to take more steps. And uh, there are a lot of advice books that talk about how tiring it is to take all of these steps. But a efficient kitchen is a small kitchen. And in fact, not everybody wants a small kitchen. Um, one woman writing in 1900, describes a small kitchen as much more convenient than a large one, quote, although even that has its drawbacks as the whole family are apt to congregate where mother is. It's anything but agreeable to have every inch of available space around the cook stove occupied by irresponsible hungry people while the cook, tired and perhaps cross, must reach in between or over their heads to attend to things. So there's this beginning of a push-pull between small, efficient space and social space. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. The most efficient kitchen ever designed is this one. Um, and it is known as the Frankfurt Kitchen. It was designed by a female architect who was hired to design uh, apartment buildings in Frankfurt, Germany. She was German. Um, and to create kitchens that would be efficient. And this is what she came up with. Um, and as you can see, she took her lead 
from um, laboratories, from scientific laboratories, where everything that you need is in reach. And she created all of these little handles are drawers um, where various things are stored. And of course, the idea is that you would know exactly which drawer you needed. So these um, apartment buildings in Frankfurt were filled with these kitchens. Since then, they've become models of design. The Museum of Modern Art has a Frankfurt kitchen in its collections, but they were enormously unsuccessful because as the 1900 woman wrote, families gather where mother is. Um, and so you have, as soon as you put two people in this space, it's no longer efficient. But an adaptation of that kitchen can be found at the Gropius house. Walter Gropius, of course, was an architect who trained and taught in Germany. He almost certainly would have known the architect who designed the Frankfurt kitchen. He almost certainly would have known the Frankfurt kitchen itself. Um, this is the kitchen that he designed for his family home in Lincoln, um, Massachusetts when he moved from England to the States to teach at Harvard in the 1930s. And this is, as you can see, very much along the modern ideal or the kitchens that many of us would have grown up with, where you have these integrated cabinetry with countertops at an equal height with storage above and below that is at equal height to the sink and to the stove. Um, it is as efficient, as can be, although again, it's designed for one person. And in the case of the Gropius family, it was designed for their cook who they brought with them from Germany. Um, and uh, she was um, left alone to do her work in the kitchen um, while the family gathered in the living room or dining room right outside. But during the war, World War II, she went off to a munitions factory where she could earn a lot more money, leaving behind Gropius's second wife, uh, Isa, who you see here, to do the cooking herself. So suddenly she's stuck by herself in the kitchen preparing meals. And according to her stepdaughter, it was not all that successful. She writes, all the delicate, this is the stepdaughter writing about her stepmother after the um, servant has left, all the delicate gourmet recipes that Isa had collected now lay in her own lap and were to be served impeccably on the dot of seven. After all, this is a German family and impeccably on the dot of seven would have been understood, understood and assumed. In time, she became a cook of great expertise, but never one of joy. And the atmosphere of dogged desperation, which I remember in the kitchen is no doubt partly the reason why I, this is the stepdaughter, never learned to cook. This is, we're, we're getting into the 20th century kitchen as we understand it as we were young and as we understand it today. And one of the things that creates the 20th century kitchen is the introduction of electricity, which came slowly. Um, this is a General Electric ad uh, published in the 1930s showing the electricity coming to the farm. You can see the electric worker who's working on a um, pole to bring electricity to this farm. And the image suggests, you know, the sun is coming up um, by the lighting. Uh, but of course, it was a long time before everyone had electricity. It was a very long time before electricity made its way, um, particularly to rural areas. And so both in the Northeast and in the South, you continued to have the same kind of technology in use well into the 20th century that had been in use for decades, if not centuries. Now it's one thing to talk about an ideal kitchen, but of course, very few people live in an ideal world. Um, and among those who don't are those who emigrate uh, to New York and live in tenement buildings. So instead of having your safe space where only cooking happens, it's the same space where families gather and where work is done. This is a group uh, of family who are making money through lace making, um, but they're gathered around the one warm space in their building. So that's the first half of the 20th century. And now we'll move to the post-war years. And the interesting thing about what happened during World War II 
is that there was nearly 100% employment. And so people were making money, but companies were all invested in the war effort. So for instance, General Electric was no longer making stoves, it was making airplanes. Um, and so there's a period when people are accumulating uh, money without having anything to spend it on. And so there becomes a housing crisis after the end of the war and um, people want to get out of the city. And this particular family is living outside of Hartford in a Quonset hut awaiting the development of new built housing. The person who um, succeeded the most out of this uh, period was a man named William Levitt who was the creator of four Levitt towns. And this is really the beginning of what we think of as sort of the ticky-tocky um, suburbanization of America. But what he was doing was something that was fundamentally new. And that was he was creating housing that would suit a modern family. And this housing was built in Long Island, in New Jersey, and in Pennsylvania. And here we have um, a particular family. The woman holding the baby is Sally Sandusky. She's standing there with a couple of friends in front of her Jubilee type uh, house in Levittown, Pennsylvania. And it was uh, fully modern when she moved in in the 1850s and 1950s. And this is the kitchen that she had, which she hated. Um, and it was the beginning of designed obsolescence. Levitt partnered with General Electric, and General Electric had the brainstorm to create uh, matching appliances in unusual colors, because that meant that when one appliance went, you would want to replace them all so that they would be like colored again. So here you've got your refrigerator, stove over here, and a um, laundry as well all with this um, sort of blush pink color, which is what Sally Sandusky hated. But the other thing that you're seeing is the beginning of the open plan. And this at the time was thought of as the California model of living. And so you've got a U-shaped kitchen, very efficient, but it opens directly into a breakfast area, which in, in itself opens then into a living room and a dining area, but probably most of your work would be happening, you know, school work would happen in the kitchen and um, the family would gather for informal meals in the kitchen. And we've got a cutaway here showing a car. So this would be the garage. You could walk into the uh, dining area or eating area and kitchen right from the garage. So Sally Sandusky was uh, still very much alive when we were doing this project and we were able to talk to her about the kitchen, which is how I know that she hated it. But she was very thrifty and she hung on to it till the bitter end, which in her case was the 1990s when finally the appliances could no longer be replaced. And at that point, she tore it out and gave it to the Pennsylvania Histor History Museum, which is where you see it here. And she had a new kitchen put in much more to her liking and which was not pink. Um, but at the same time, her experience in Levittown was a good one. That was not true for this woman whose name is Daisy Myers. Um, and she purchased, bought into Levittown from a family which had bought directly from Levitt himself. William Levitt wrote that while he could so solve the housing crisis in America, he could not solve all of the crises in America, including the crises of race. And therefore he refused to sell to Jewish families or black families, but he did not prevent people who bought housing from him to sell to whoever they cho chose. And Daisy Myers and her husband were among the first black families to move into Levittown and their experience was anything but joyous. And in fact, I think this is a really, really poignant photo because on the one hand, you can see her almost, um, well, looking out with anxiety and her kitchen has become not a place of solace so much, but a place of um, a bunker, a protective area where she hopes she can protect her newborn child while people are burning crosses on her front yard. And it wasn't until the 
Pennsylvania uh, Attorney General stepped in that they were protected by state police until finally the um, hoo-ha died down. But while we were able to talk to Sally Sandusky, Daisy Myers was not interested in talking about her experience. And the only reason we know about this is that um, it was written about in Life magazine as um, the downside of life in one of these planned communities. And then we have the Madison Avenue version of the kitchen. And this is um, where a kitchen where everything's clean, children are bright and happy and smiling. Mom looks lovely in her elegant cocktail dress with a um, with a uh, apron that exactly matches the decoration in her kitchen. Everything matches, everything's spotless and clean. Um, and of course, this is uh, not uh, the way people actually lived, but it's the way Madison Avenue wanted you to believe that you could live if you had yourself a nice kitchen like this one. Um, this is in counter opposition to what we saw in the 1870s house where people wanted to have the veneer of never setting foot in the kitchen. Now, instead, you've moved into an informal world where you are living informally in the kitchen at least part of the time with your family and it's family space, which it was not, very much not before that. So not only is Madison Avenue thinking about kitchens, but so is industry. Um, and it's not until after World War II that you start to have freezers, domestic freezers that were successfully used. And so along with freezers, you get the development of side industries like TV dinners or like the Tupperware industry. And look at this woman with her um, beautifully done nails and her pearls looking up joyously at her Tupperware. Um, so there's this sort of 50s um, veneer of the kitchen as the um, central um, space in a home where everybody is happy and everything's clean and everything's lovely. And not everybody was so happy. Um, and one of my favorite, uh, other favorite people um, who uh, we researched as part of this project was Peg Bracken, who wrote the I Hate to Cook book, which I will say was one of my mother's favorites. Um, <clears throat> And in fact, I can still remember my mother laughing over uh, the book um, because of this irreverent approach that Peg Bracken took to the task of preparing the family meals. Um, for instance, in her recipe for beef stroganoff, she writes, quote, add the flour, salt, paprika, and mushrooms, stir, and let cook five minutes while you light a cigarette and stare sullenly at the sink. I'm sympathetic. I wish that I were more sympathetic instead to Julia Child. And Julia Child and Peg Bracken are kind of the opposite extremes of what cooking was in the 1960s in America. And as Julia Childs would tell you herself, were she still around, she had no idea that the work that she and her two French friends were doing would have such a huge impact on American culture. Um, in fact, all she was trying to do was to learn herself how to cook um, at the Cordon Bleu in Paris, where she was living with her husband, um, and then to bring what she learned back to her friends when she moved back to Cambridge after leaving um, Paris. And before long, she becomes the center of this entirely new gourmet world, which is still very much with us today. Not the least, I think, because of... Um, WGBH is uh, recognizing in her a star and bringing her in along with her husband, who was often um, down below camera level, looking up at her and, and feeding her lines. Um, so Julia Child versus Peg Bracken, um, 1960s. Towards the late 60s, um, we start to get counterculture developing, especially the hippie culture. And um, on the left, we see a commune outside of San Francisco. And the um, great thing about the commune is that suddenly meals are being shared. And I will say that um, hardcore feminists today believe that it won't be until meal preparation is shared communally that women can truly be um, 
living on an equal footing with men who choose not to cook. Um, but in fact, here we see um, in the commune, um, as I said, the, everyone had a responsibility for one meal a week. And so the rest of the time you could be going about your daily business. Madison Avenue looks at the women's lib kitchen and places this woman alone in her kitchen. So it's it's as exactly backwards as you could possibly be to mm -hmm. understand what women's liberation was really meant to do for women and kitchen work. And now I'll leap us forward to the kitchen today. Um, and in fact, the kitchen today is um, very much a space uh, for gathering as opposed to a space only for um, function. And the um, result is it tends to be larger than those small U-shaped kitchens of the early 20th century. Um, it's a space where family can gather. It's also a space where others can gather as well. And it's what you see over time in the 20th century is this push-pull between family as social space and family as efficient workspace. An efficient workspace is a small space a social space is a large one and not efficient. So imagine you are someone who cooks in this kitchen. You're gonna be walking around this large island every time you need to get to your refrigerator or your microwave. The stove is back here and the sink is back here. So this is a big piece of real estate right in the middle of this very large space. And if you were to count steps, as you did in the early 20th century, you would be counting a lot of steps indeed, which goes to show that the kitchen is no longer this um, arduous workplace, that there are um, possibilities aside from having to cook that um, well-to-do American families can take part in. And so the kitchen can be used um, really as... Um, oh, what's the word I'm trying to think of as uh, relaxation, for relaxation, as opposed to the grind of day-to-day -day food prep. Needless to say, not everyone has an ideal kitchen. Some people have families with children, and some people have kitchens that have inadequate workspace, inadequate, uh, inadequate electrical outlets. So you can see these um, plugs uh, back here. Um, and the kitchen is a, a space that is not highly designed. Um, and also not everybody lives uh, in a space where they can have a big kitchen. Some people live in cities. And in cities, you have a tendency not to give up a lot of real estate, uh, real estate for your kitchen. But in fact, you can still create amazing meals um, as is witnessed by this particular person. Um, some of you will know that this is Mark Bittman who is the former New York Times uh, editor of the Cooking Pages and the um, author of some really fantastic cookbooks. And he describes his kitchen as minimal, but also um, stands firm on the fact that that's all he needs. Um, you don't need a lot of space. You don't need a lot of, uh, a lot of equipment to create fantastic meals. What he does have that a lot of New Yorkers do not, and what he's very proud of is the window. Um, in fact, um, there are many um, New York apartments, as many of you probably know, that have no windows. Um, and so while he's giving up the use of that wall, at the same time, he's got great light coming in. Now, with Mark Bittman, um, I think we uh, need to talk about an important development that's occurred in the late 20th century, and that's the increasing involvement of men in the kitchen. Um, and it's not only um, because families um, don't necessarily stay together as they did in earlier generations, but also because I think men are taking uh, time and responsibility more and more for cooking. When we did our project in the 2000 aughts, um, we did a marketing survey across the country to find out how many women were still 100% responsible for the meals of their family. And we found that it was only about 50% and that 50% of men cooked regularly. Um, and, so, uh, and so you have a sea change from the earlier part of the 
uh, 20th and even 18th and 19th centuries, where it was um, it was very much divided by gender, and much less so today. And I'll leave you with this image, um, which I think is a, a really great example of a man cooking. Um, but it reminds me of a quotation that was in the New York Times by a University of Pennsylvania um, sociologist who wrote, it's only since men have been cooking that you can justify the $275 knife. So that is, in a nutshell, or not in a nutshell, uh, a very fast run through 300 years of kitchen history. Um, I hope it's been entertaining for you, and um, I'll be happy to hear comments, take questions, um, which I think Cindy may be able to see in the chat box. And I hope that you all now can put your own kitchens into some kind of historical context. Yes, thank you so much. That was incredible. And I did see that we had some questions and some comments come through the chat. Let's see. Question. Did your research reveal different uses or approaches to the kitchen over time, depending on immigrant origi origins of the owner or cook chef? Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, one of the most interesting things that I learned about um, was a um, Southern Mediterranean um, practice of having two kitchens in the house or in the apartment. Um, there would be a show kitchen on the main floor of the house, which was never used for cooking, but it would be fully um, fitted out as a kitchen. But then there would be a work kitchen <clears throat> in the basement. Um, and that was found frequently in Brooklyn um, and less frequently up here. Although we um, learned of a family of Greek immigrants who um, were uh, had recently redone their work kitchen in the basement. And against the husband's desire, uh, his wife was insisting now that they redo the never used 1950s kitchen uh, on the main floor. So that was one of the main differences that I discovered. I had never heard of this practice of having two functional kitchens, but only one in use. Um, certainly food ways were very different. Um, and, and also, of course, class would make a difference um, according to how much money was available. Um, today, you know, there are um, there are sleeping room onlys where people, immigrants are living with, perhaps they might have a, um, uh, you know, a, a, an electric um, stove top, but perhaps they might not. Um, and so it's it's an incremental thing of developing a full kitchen for many immigrant families. Thank you. And I pardon if there was a lot of noise in the background just a minute, my partner's actually in the kitchen cooking. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, see. We've got one of those open, great open concept houses. So there's just no way of getting away from the kitchen. Um, a couple of comments here. I enjoy your cutaway drawings of the kitchens. And many kitchens had checkerboard floors. Interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> and yes, we will be emailing out a link to um, tonight's program for those that have signed up. Someone also noted that the kitchen strainer hasn't changed much over the years. Um, and is it possible for you to provide a list of the books you mentioned? Um, so um, I don't remember which books I mentioned. Um, I think that um, 
there are websites that focus on 19th century cookware or books. Um, the University of Michigan has a huge cooking um, library, uh, cookbook library, as does Radcliffe um, at Harvard. So those are really great resources. And in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the Radcliffe Library doesn't have a list of historic cookbooks, major historic cookbooks. Okay. And we can try to, to pull the, the books mentioned in this and create a link to, um, to those books in our consortium. Uh, another um, viewer noted that his apron is just too clean. <laughs> um, see. um a lot of great thank yous uh great last picture with the induction stove oh. Oh. Uh, informative and fun thank you so much um please comment on the impact of fuels especially gas versus electric yeah yeah, so um, I wish that I were um, more technologically minded than I am. Um, there's a period at the end of the 19th century when there's a lot of experimentation with fuel, including gasoline run stoves, which seems like a dangerous thing and in fact was a dangerous thing. Um, and so you were using oil. Um, I, I uh, electricity becomes increasingly used as the 20th century advances. Um, it's not until after the war that you start having freezers, for instance. But in terms of the different kinds of fuels, um, I'm I'm going to pass on that because I'm going to get the details wrong. Uh, comment that I think families from India have two kitchens. One just for cooking spices, the other to prepare, prepare meals. The odors stay in the smaller kitchen with the spices. Oh, interesting. Um, how common were summer kitchens? I lived in a house outside Boston where there was a kitchen in the basement as well as upstairs on the main living floor, which the family used in the summer. So I will say that there's... Uh... Summer kitchens are more common elsewhere than they are in New England. Um, you find them in upstate New York. You find them increasingly commonly as you move south. And the reason for that is that nobody in the south wants a fire going in the summer in their house. Um, it's not, um, it's also the case that um, in plantations, um, it was a way to separate the enslaved population from the white population to have a kitchen that was in a separate building. Um, but in New England, they exist, um, but they tend to be much less um, frequent than elsewhere. What you do have in New England sometimes, and are the house that I showed you with the intact 187 kitchen was an example of that is that you might have like a dirty kitchen and a clean kitchen. You might have a kitchen for doing big chores like laundry and butchering and a clean kitchen for doing your more refined cooking. Thank you. Comment. I grew up in the Philippines. We have two kitchens, one oh. for show, but the other kitchen we carry all, of, which we carry all of which we call, sorry, the dirty kitchen is where all the cooking happens. Oh yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was new to me, it's fascinating. Um, and I will say that, that did I mention this? I told you that I had met with a Greek family. We actually took the show kitchen lock, stock and barrel and added it to Historic New England's collections to represent that use of two kitchens amongst different immigrant families. Um, and I think it's really important to know about. And clearly it's a, a vein that runs through many groups, um, but it's not um, part of the sort of mainstream understanding of kitchens in the Northeast um, and yet not that uncommon, but interesting that it was in the Philippines as well. 
A question, the dresser that was shown in the coffin house, would that be called a North Shore dresser? No, no, it is a North Shore dresser, but um, would not, I, I don't know that as a historic term. Um, it's certainly a, a, a dresser and it's certainly on the North Shore, but um, it's, it's very rare. Um, I know of only one other surviving example from the 18th century. Um, and so there aren't enough of them to have a name. Maybe there's more than two, but there aren't many that are surviving from that period. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question here for you. Uh, we have an old house that doesn't appear to have a kitchen. Our living room has a central fireplace with arms that hang posts, etc. Uh, hang pots, etc. Did early houses use what we call a living room as the kitchen as well as a living and sleep space? For sure, the main living area in early houses was the same space that cooking went on. Um, it was only the well-to-do, the very few well-to-do who were um, able to have a separate sort of living area. And not the least just for um, the fact that you would want to heat one room. You would want to be in the room where the fire was most of the year in New England. Um, and particularly in the early 18th century, which was part of a mini ice age. Um, and so if you have a big hearth with a crane, which hangs pots from it, that is the room that was lived in, that was used both for cooking and living. You didn't mention sculleries, which were common in the UK. Were they not used here? So I think you could call that um, what I call the China pantry um, off the kitchen in um, in Bloomington, Illinois. I think you might be able to call that a scullery, um, although it was where really clean cleaning was done. It was where China was cleaned, not where um, dirty cleaning was done. So I don't know how common a sort of dirty cleaning part would be in uh, parts of New parts of America. Thank you. Looks like our last question here is, what happened in the show kitchens? Well, um, I think that um, I think that uh, the woman who has a show kitchen could tell us. I think that um, the family that I knew, uh, this was in North Andover, the Greek family, they would use the show kitchen for bridge clubs or for, you know, cocktail parties. Um, and you would have your canapes that had been prepared down in the work kitchen. You would have them presented um, out of the show kitchen. Um, so it was it was the sort of interim step between work and presentation, uh, at least at that kitchen. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Nancy, um, for this incredible presentation. And thank you, everyone um, who's joined us. So um, I hope you had a wonderful time. And um, I hope you uh, join us again for another upcoming program. It was great to see so many of you come in today. And so thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.